Hey everyone, welcome to Advanced Exercise Physiology. This is on Chapter 2, Control of the Internal Environment. The objectives of this chapter are to define the terms homeostasis and steady state, to diagram and discuss a biological control system, as well as be able to give an example of a biological control system. In addition, we want to be able to explain the terms negative feedback and define what is meant by the gain of a control system. For those of you who are taking notes, here's a simple outline to follow for the current lecture. The first thing we want to address is how to understand graphs. Although this might seem simple, it's important that we understand each variable as well as what the graph represents. So in general, graphs are used to illustrate a relationship between two variables. You have an independent variable, which is represented on the x-axis of the graph. This one can be manipulated by the researcher. There's also a dependent variable, which is on the y-axis, the vertical axis, and this changes as a function of the independent variable on the x-axis. Here's an example of a graph that shows the relationship between heart rate and exercise intensity. In this case, the dependent variable is heart rate on the y-axis, and it changes as a function of the exercise intensity. The independent variable, again, is the exercise intensity, which is demonstrated in the x-axis which is running horizontally on this graph. From this graph, we can see that as exercise intensity increases, which is again the independent variable, heart rate increases, which is the dependent variable. Now looking at homeostasis, this is referred to as dynamic constancy. Homeostasis was be defined as the maintenance of a constant and normal internal environment. Now if we're looking at steady state, that is a physiological variable that is unchanging, but in some cases not necessarily normal. The balance between demands placed in the body and the body's response to those demands. Examples would be body temperature as well as arterial blood pressure. Now looking at this graph, this is going to look at changes in body core temperature during exercise. What we can see is changes in the body core temperature during submaximal exercise show that at some point the body temperature reaches a plateau or again a steady state. On the y-axis we are going to be seeing the body core temperature which is dependent upon the exercise time. Another graph reflecting changes in arterial blood pressure at rest show that although the arterial blood pressure oscillates over time the mean pressure remains constant. So in summary, homeostasis is defined as the maintenance of a constant or unchanging normal internal environment during unstressed conditions. The term steady state is also defined as a constant internal environment, but this does not necessarily mean that the internal environment is at rest or normal. When the body is in a steady state, a balance has been achieved between the demands placed on the body and the body's response to those demands. Again, the key is this does not necessarily mean that it's normal. Now, if we move on and look at control systems of the body, there's intracellular control systems. This would involve protein breakdown and synthesis, energy production, and maintenance of stores nutrients. We also have organ systems. Examples would be the pulmonary and the circulatory systems. These would be involved in replenishing oxygen and the removal of carbon dioxide. Now there are examples of non-biological control systems. A very simple and easy one is a thermostat that controls the heating and the cooling system. An increase in temperature above the set point signals the air conditioner to turn on, while a decrease in room temperature below the set point results in a turning off of the furnace. Again, this is an example of a control system, however in this case this is non-biological. But if you look at biological control systems, there's a series of interconnected components that maintain a physical or chemical parameter at a near constant value. Now those components can involve a sensor or receptor which is going to detect changes in the variable. There will also be a control center which assesses input and initiates a response as well as an effector that changes the internal environment back to normal. In this diagram we can see the different components of a biological control system. We either have too much or too little of a stimulus, and this will lead to a change in the internal conditions. A sensor 
will sense the difference and it will lead the data to the control center. In the control center, there will be a response to the stimulus, which will lead to an effect, and a negative feedback and a return to normal, which we will call homeostasis. Now, referring to negative feedback, it's the response that reverses the initial disturbance in homeostasis. An example would be an increase in extracellular carbon dioxide that triggers a receptor, then sends information to a respiratory control center. Respiratory muscles are then activated to increase breathing, which results in the CO2 concentration or carbon dioxide concentrations returning to normal. Most control systems work via this negative feedback. Now, in addition to a negative feedback, there's a positive feedback as well, and this response increases the original stimulus. For example, during the initiation of childbirth, there's a stimulus in the receptors of the cervix. This sends a message to the brain, which triggers the release of oxytocin from a pituitary gland. The oxytocin then promotes increased uterine contractions. This again is an example of positive feedback. Now, looking at the gain of a control system, this is the degree to which the control system maintains homeostasis. Systems with large gain are more capable of maintaining homeostasis than systems with low gain. An example would be the pulmonary or cardiovascular systems which have large gains. So in summary, a biological control system is composed of a sensor, a control center, and an effector. Most control systems act by way of negative feedback, not positive feedback. And the degree to which a control system maintains homeostasis is termed the gain of the system. A control system with a large gain is more capable of maintaining homeostasis than a system with low gain. Now if we look at examples of homeostatic control, we can look at regulation of body temperature, where thermal receptors send messages to the brain, and the response is by skin vessels and sweat glands regulating the temperature. Another example is regulation of blood glucose, the function of the endocrine system, which requires the hormone insulin. Elevated blood glucose signals the pancreas to release this insulin, whereby the insulin causes a cellular uptake of glucose. Again, regulation of body temperature and the regulation of blood glucose are both examples of homeostatic control. Now, if we look more closely at the regulation of body temperature in this diagram, you'll see that a negative feedback mechanism is what regulates the body temperature. Now, if we look at the regulation of blood glucose, this is an illustration of how the regulation of blood glucose is affected by concentration. As blood glucose increases, the pancreas acts both as a sensor and an effector organ, but ultimately this follows a negative feedback as well. Now, the failure of a biological control system results in disease. The failure of any component in the control system results in a disturbance in homeostasis. An example of this would be type 1 di diabetes. The damage to beta cells in the pancreas are what cause the disease. Insulin is no longer released into the blood, and hyperglycemia results. This represents a failure of the effector. Now again, any component of the control system can result in the disturbance of the homeostasis. We just looked at the effector in this particular example. Now talking about exercise, exercise actually disrupts the homeostasis of the body by changes in either pH, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and the temperature. Control systems are capable of maintaining steady state during submaximal exercises in a relatively cool environment. However, intense exercise or prolonged exercise in a hot or humid environment may exceed the body's ability to maintain a steady state. This may result in fatigue and or having to quit the exercise. Now exercise can actually improve homeostatic control in the body via cellular adaptation. Now if we look at adaptation, it's actually the change in the structure or function of a cell or organ system and this results in improvability to maintain homeostasis. Acclimatization is the adaptation to a particular environmental stress. Heat stress in a hot environment is one example of this. If we look at cell signaling, this is going to be the communication between cells using chemical messengers 
and this is extremely important for maintaining homeostasis in the body. Now talking about cell signaling mechanisms in more detail, we have an intracrine signaling, which is chemical messengers inside the cell triggering a response. We have juxtacrine signaling, which are chemical messengers passed between two connected cells. There's also autocrine signaling, which is when chemical messengers act on that same cell. Paracrine signaling, where chemical messengers act on nearby cells. And finally, endocrine signaling, where chemical messengers are released into the blood only to affect cells with specific receptors. Stress proteins can actually assist in the regulation of cellular homeostasis as well. Cells actually synthesize stress proteins when homeostasis is disrupted. An example of this is heat shock proteins, which can repair damage to proteins in a cell. Stresses would include, but are not limited to, high temperature, a low cellular energy level, abnormal pH, alterations in a cell's calcium, and protein damage by free radicals. Exercise can also induce these stresses. Now again, if we look at stress proteins and how they assist in the regulation of homeostasis, we have a stress that affects a normal protein within a cell, which results ultimately in a damaged protein. During this process, the cell is able to synthesize a stress protein which can help attach and help repair the damaged protein. At that point, once the protein is repaired, there's going to be a release of the stress protein and we will ultimately end up with a normal protein back in the cell to help maintain homeostasis. Now if we take a quick overview of the cellular protein synthesis, exercise-induced protein synthesis improves the body's ability and the cell's ability to maintain homeostasis. This process involves exercise activating a cell signaling pathway. This activates transcriptional activator molecules. These transcriptional activators bind to a gene promoter region. This ultimately allows DNA to transcribe mRNA. mRNA then leaves a the nucleus and binds to ribosomes. And then finally, the mRNA is translated into a protein. Both resistance and endurance exercise promote different cell signaling pathways. So in summary, exercise represents a challenge to the body's control systems to maintain homeostasis. In general, the body's control systems are capable of maintaining a steady state during most types of exercise in a relatively cool environment. However, intense exercise or prolonged work in what we would call a hostile environment, which would be high temperature or humidity, may exceed the body's ability or the control system to maintain that steady state, and severe disturbances of homeostasis may occur. Acclimatization is the change that occurs in response to repeated stresses and results in the improved function of an existing homeostatic system. This is also referred to adaptation. Also, cell signaling is defined as a system of communication that governs cellular activities and coordinates cell actions. A variety of cell signaling mechanisms participate in the regulation of homeostasis and are required to regulate cellular adaptation. The major cell signaling mechanisms include intracrine signaling, juxtacrine signaling, autocrine signaling, paracrine signaling, and finally endocrine signaling. And finally, exercise-induced protein synthesis occurs via cell signaling events that lead to the activation of genes, which leads to protein synthesis and an improved ability to maintain homeostasis during the stress of exercise. Now to help you learn this information a little bit more thoroughly, I want to give you some study questions to help you. The first question will be to define the term homeostasis and how does it differ from the term steady state? Question two will be to cite an example of a biological homeostatic control system. Three, please draw a simple diagram that demonstrates the relationship between the components of a biological control system. Four, briefly explain the role of the receptor, the integrating center, 
and the effector organ in a biological control system. Five, please explain the terms negative feedback and give a biological example of negative feedback. Six, please discuss the concept of gain associated with a biological control system. Seven, define cell signaling and outline the five types of cell signaling mechanisms that participate in the regulation of homeostasis and cellular adaptation. And eight, please list the steps that lead to exercise-induced increases in protein synthesis in skeletal muscles. That concludes chapter two, the control of the internal environment. If you have any questions, please refer to your textbook or refer to the information in this lecture. As always, you feel free to email me with any questions you might have as well. Thanks.